Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, brought to you by Compliance Week and All Voices. I'm Aaron Nicodemus with Compliance Week, and I'll be your host. Today's webcast is Beyond Whistleblower Compliance, Best Practices for Acquiring and Acting on Employee Concerns and Feedback. Before we hear from our presenters, let me review the agenda. We're scheduled to go for one hour. After the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. The questions will be kept confidential and anonymous, so please don't be shy. You can ask your questions at any time using the ask a question function on the left-hand side of your screen, and I'll pose them to our guest at the end of her presentation. After the q and I'll wrap up the webcast. This webcast will offer CPE credit for all attendees. Please be sure you are using either Google Chrome or Firefox as your internet browser, and please disable your pop-up blockers in order to access, uh, ensure access to the exam. Once I have signed off and the webcast is completely over, the final examination will be presented automatically in a separate window. If you have trouble viewing the CPE test or receiving the CPE certificate, please send an email to webcasts with an S at compliancewith.com. Once again, to ensure receipt of your CPE credit, please be sure you are using either Google Chrome or Firefox as your internet browser. If you've missed anything, I'll repeat these instructions at the end of the webcast so stay tuned. A few other administrative details. At any time during the presentation, listeners can download the slides from the drop-down menu on the left-hand side of your screen. Then you will find the feedback form for the webcast. We welcome your thoughts as we are always looking to improve your experience. If you wish to increase the slide size, hit View Slide Full Screen, the button on the top right of your screen. And lastly, a help button is located in the upper right-hand corner of your screen for assistance. I'd like to welcome today's speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Madison Kamek, Senior Customer Success Manager at All Voices, an employee feedback management platform that, employers, <clears throat> that empowers employees to anonymously provide feedback, ask questions, share positive input, and report harassment, bias, or cultural issues directly to their company leadership. It's great to have you with us. With that, I turn it over to Madison to get us started. Great, thank you so much. And hi, everyone. So thrilled to be, to be here today um, presenting to you all. Um, so let's go ahead and kick it off. Um, let's start with why employee feedback matters. So before starting All Voices, we spoke with hundreds of employees before starting the company. What we learned was that employees wanted to provide real-time feedback to their companies, but current methods were not trusted or utilized. And yet the need to collect and act upon feedback has never been greater. Employees are intimidated by overly formal whistleblower hotlines, distrustful of internal feedback collection methods like a SurveyMonkey or Google Forms. So they're not feeling like they're able to voice or share their concerns. But giving employees a voice is so crucial right now in today's labor market and during this quote unquote great resignation. The overall state of today's workplace demands that we prioritize employee voices and happiness. Why? Because the state of the workplace is in turmoil. There have been a lot of changes that are leading to rapid employee resignation. If you look at the state of the workplace in 2022, here are some of the stats that we're seeing. Employee engagement has decreased globally by two percentage points. Workers' daily stress has reached a record high of 43% from last year's 38%. 41% of remote workers never want to go back to the office. And 55% of Americans anticipate looking for a new job in the next 12 months. There are also many factors and variables of employee well-being that are not being measured, caused by things like employees picking up the slack after team members leave for other jobs, homeschooling children, feeling frustrated by the pandemic and not being able to see their families, feeling cooped up, or feeling less connection with coworkers. All of this has played a role in employee turnover and overall morale. And in addition to these changes in the labor market, the increase of remote and hybrid work has also reshaped workplaces. 
introducing an entirely new range of compliance risks and developments, biases and harassment, fraud and whistleblower activity, workplace safety conditions, cybersecurity, data protection, and more, leading to stats like these. One in four women experienced an increase of harassment while working remotely. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, Office of Inspector General, OSHA whistleblower claims have increased by 30%. 2020 was a record high year for SEC tips, a 25% increase from 2019, and only 3% of misconduct being reported through traditional hotlines. 52% of employees have experienced unsafe working conditions this past year. 47% of individuals have fallen for phishing scams while working at home. And there's been a 15% increase in previously unseen malware and cyber attack methods. So what does all of this decrease in employee morale and increase in new compliance risks and developments mean for employers? Well, this is what it meant for employers as of last month. In early December, we did an anonymous survey of 400 verified HR managers, supervisors, leaders, directors, vice presidents, and executives from 400 different companies. 80% of these survey recipients shared that their companies had lost more than 20% of their workforce so far. Of this 80%, 20% shared that their companies had lost 51 or more percent of their employees. 71% of employees lost were mid and senior level employees that cost an average of $81,000 to replace. So let's calculate the average of what these 400 companies have lost financially so far. If a 500 person company lost 30% of their workforce at an $81,000 average cost to replace an employee, they're looking at a $12 million loss. We will be releasing a case study on this survey in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in receiving that study information, go ahead and leave your name, company email, and company name in the, in the, in the comments. This current state of the workplace for employer can also mean costly legal action. It is estimated that 20% of all small businesses will face employee litigation. $250,000 is the average cost to defend a harassment lawsuit. And the average jury award for companies found liable is $600,000. It can also mean reputational damage. 63% of a company's market value is attributed to its overall reputation on average. 76% of companies who experienced a reputation damaging crisis said that the crisis was, was preventable. And lastly, it can lead to a decrease in revenue. You can see here that 64% of consumers stopped purchasing a brand after hearing news of that company's poor employee treatment. The bottom line is that the state of the workplace is leaning in favor of employees at a very high cost to employers. For an employee, the state of the workplace is in turmoil, but it's also ripe with opportunity. For an employer, the state of the workplace has become a battlefield. Staying highly competitive in the minds of employees and potential employees has become not a nice to have, but a critical business operation. Knowing how to keep your employees happy and loyal is more important than ever. Keeping employees happy helps, keep, helps companies avoid the cost of turnover, legal action and reputational damage, and companies with happy employees outperform their competition by 20%. So why is real-time employee feedback the solution to solving these, businesses, these, these business problems in today's world? Because you can't keep your employees happy and build a positive workplace culture if you don't know what your employees want. And if, also if you're not aware of what's happening at all levels of your organization. Collecting employee feedback allows you to become more risk intelligent and allows compliance teams to identify risk more proactively. Here's an insight into employee feedback from an expert in the industry. According to Shelby, founder of Shelby Wolpa Consulting, long gone are the days where an annual performance review checks the box for feedback. 
Companies that care about a culture, about culture and creating a productive and engaged workforce are taking a multi-pronged approach to feedback where it's ingrained into every moment across the employee life cycle. Feedback is an, is an essential component of growth and development at work, but it's something that many companies don't get right. Whether feedback is delivered in a one-on-one -on -one or through a more formal performance process, it's crucial to deliver it well. Feedback should be meaningful and is most valuable when it's specific, tied to a tangible outcome, respectful, timely, and ongoing. And according to Jillian, Chief of Staff at JW Player, employee feedback, it, a culture of feedback, is important because, especially in our company, people are our product in a lot of ways. Yes, we are a software company, but people are what make us work. If we're missing the voices of certain people and how we're building out strategy, we're not having our best strategy. Okay. So we've established that employee feedback really is the golden ticket here. Here is why you should source feedback beyond just compliance and regulation. In 2002, U.S. Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. This legislative action requires public American companies to provide whistleblowing channels and appropriate processes for addressing any complaints. Because of this legislation, when thinking about employee feedback and concerns, many employers' first thought is to get a whistleblower hotline to just check that legal box. But these hotlines, many of which were developed 20 years ago when this legislation was passed, are not enough. They're often intimidating, formal, and clunky. They're rarely used. They're not entirely anonymous. They don't allow for case tracking or trend analysis, and they don't provide they provide no means of follow-up, leading to incomplete reports. We now have the communication, security, and analysis technology to truly support workers who speak up. In today's society, your company, staff, and employees deserve comprehensive, modern, and accessible reporting and tracking solutions. Compliance, when approached with an empathetic mindset, can ensure that your business practices are developed with the end user in mind. Remember to look at the why in compliance, because rules and regulations are the product of social issues. So be sure to look at those social issues. So how can you collect feedback? By using one of the common methods of feedback collection here. Regular one-on-ones, an open door policy within your organization, people business partners or HR business partners, anonymous reporting platforms, hotlines, surveys like engagement surveys or life cycle or annual surveys. But in integrating an empathetic mindset when it comes to compliant business practices, how should you collect feedback? You should be using all of the methods. In fact, using just one method is not quite effective. The ideal employee feedback structure should have all of the forums previously listed available to employees. And sharing these, sharing these available forums should be an ongoing process designed to inform, educate, support, and listen, I-E-S-L. This acronym was created by All Voices expert Shelby Wolpa. So thank you, Shelby, for that. And I-E-S-L stands for inform, so you want to inform employees what feedback programs exist, why they're important, and what to expect when providing feedback via various channels. Educate, you want to educate employees on specific guidance, tools, and information, whether that's through internet resources, live training, et cetera. And support, you want to support employees in different ways to assist individuals through the process. So through office hours, EAP, skip level one-on-one, et cetera. And lastly, listen. You want to listen to ensure the employee is really heard. The listening has to be ongoing and accessible. That again can be through one-on-one, engagement surveys, focus groups, anonymous reporting, et cetera. So when you implement a comprehensive feedback management system, here are the benefits that you can expect. 
increasing the positive. Strong employee trust, engagement, and loyalty means that employees are innovative, productive, and loyal. These employees are actively dedicated to doing better, learning more, accomplishing their goals, and beyond. This leads to increased productivity, revenue, and smoother business operations. Collecting feedback on what your employees think in their day-to-day -day is incredibly valuable because nobody quite knows company operations, customers, clients, bottlenecks, et cetera, more than your employees with their boots on the ground. So collecting feedback is not only a pro for employees, it's also a pro for the employer as it provides relevant details and insight into where your company can be improving and why. Benefit number two is that it will decrease your negatives. Poor workplace culture leads to turnover, negative media attention, and systemic issues. By making the feedback and evaluation process as objective and transparent as possible, employers can reduce the chances of all of these negatives. And diversifying employee feedback methods decreases the pressure of sharing concerns and can reduce legal risk. Benefit number three is that a comprehensive feedback strategy provides employers with data for relevant and effective company initiatives and proactive action. Proactive action and relevant initiatives save time, funds, resources, and morale in the long run. Initiatives that are created based on assumptions are measured via trial and error, which eats up valuable time and money. Addressing the workplace issues that truly exist developing relevant initiatives and taking proactive action against these issues that are beginning to trend helps employers avoid this. So you want to take action and implement a comprehensive feedback management strategy. You want to take your system and think beyond the checkbox. So here is where you can start. Step one. The first, tip, the first step in successfully launching an employee feedback initiative that demonstrates you're serious is sourcing employee feedback about the employee feedback initiative. So opening up the pre-planning phase for your feedback strategy demonstrates a couple of things. One, that this feedback management program will be the real deal. Encouraging feedback and acting on this feedback from the very inception of the program itself demonstrates a commitment to the cause from the beginning. Number two, it creates buzz and buy-in. Being transparent and open about the impending launch of an initiative can create excitement. And including advocates of the initiative into the planning will create program loyalty and give you strong allies and advocates to help spread the word and excitement when the program launches. So a tip for success in implementing step one, diversify the task force that will be involved in the pre-planning of this initiative. Utilize this team to ensure that your plan and policies are accessible, understandable, and user-friendly. The more diverse your pre-planning group, the more comprehensive and relatable your plan will be. If you have trouble sourcing volunteers, consider providing a stipend or perk to encourage volunteers or you can put a call out for nominations. Folks who are recognized for a positive quality and empowered to make a difference are more likely to step in. Things to avoid in implementing step one. Don't forget about getting advanced buy-in from a key member of the leadership team. This is super important. Uh, tone from the top is just as crucial as a diverse pre-planning committee. If your employees don't see buy-in from the executive level, they may resort to thinking that their feedback won't create any real change or evaluation by the, by the decision makers. Nip the thinking in the bud before it begins. Step two, build out your strategy, establish goals, select a few platforms, and get on the same page. You are sourcing employee feedback for the good of the company and the happiness of its employees. Your strategy needs to address a few crucial questions. One, what are our goals in sourcing feedback and how will we measure them? Two, 
How will we ensure successful employee adoption and buy-in? Three, who will be responding to reports and how can we standardize the response and resolution process? And four, what additional steps can we take to make this a seamless and understandable part of our company culture? Now, a tip for success in implementing step two. An effective employee feedback management strategy is easier done with a single or only a handful of tools that can help you encourage, record, track, anonymize, and analyze all forms of feedback. Ideally, this tool should be by a third-party vendor since employees will have more trust for the third-party platform that's not tied to their work email. Although it may seem like extra work in the beginning to move all of your feedback channels to a single platform, the benefits will be well worth it. Things to avoid in implementing step two. Clearly define and share what, what employee feedback is, how and why you are collecting it. Don't hide your processes. This means sharing all aspects of the feedback process, such as routing rules, you know, feedback being routed to the right person or department, and service level agreements, or SLAs. This is the feedback being acted upon within an agreed upon date and time frame. This transparency is important to building trust. Now more than ever, employees have the upper hand. The current job market means that employees are able to set their standards and stick to them. Step number three, bake it into your processes. Successful implementation will take time and continuous reminders, advocacy, and action. Your strategy should be accessible, built from your core values, and into your code of conduct. A tip for success in implementing step three is work with the team and resources that your chosen feedback platform provides. Utilize this team to support you with launching and sustaining your program. Some platforms, like All Voices, have teams that will walk you through the process, all the way from pre-planning and launch, to program development, and educational resources. Utilize this team to support you with launching and sustaining your program. They can provide additional program elements, such as company-wide meetings with the platform team, discussing the security and anonymity of the platform, or a walkthrough of the software with your employees. Now, things to avoid in implementing step three, demystify the processes. Keep it simple and transparent, don't over jargon, and speak in a way that your business can and wants to understand. Step number four, consider and be ready for the challenges. Many employees find legal compliance and HR teams scary or unapproachable. So a tip for success in implementing step four, integrate members of these quote unquote scary teams informally into the onboarding process through ERGs, staff meetings, can share out OKRs and goals regularly and build out an FAQ page about any complicated aspects of the feedback and reporting processes. In terms of things to avoid for step four, don't approach the implementation of a feedback program as rules to comply to, but rather competencies to learn. Okay, in order to take these steps and really be successful at implementing a comprehensive feedback strategy, you'll need to find a platform to help you stay organized, informed, and trusted by your employees. But not all platforms out there are created equally. Whistleblower hotlines, for example, are go-to for many companies as they check the box. However, the overly formal nature of hotlines, the collection of a voice recording, things like that, ensures that employees, in fact, don't utilize them. Internal feedback collection through surveys or Google Forms are also not entirely effective. Employee feedback management platforms, like All Voices, receive 12 times more feedback from employees. So what should you look for in your EFMP? Your EFMP, your Employee Feedback Management Platform, should have the following features. Anonymous reporting. 
your tool should be able to source encrypted, untraceable reports that don't contain identifiable data, like an IP address, email address, or name. It should be compliant. It needs to be compliant under ISO, SOC 2, whistleblower hotline compliance, and other data security and system standards. It should be integratable. Have the ability to integrate with a wide range of tools already in your tech stack. And it should be accessible and available. It should be user-friendly, optimized for all devices, and accessible anywhere there's Wi-Fi or cell service. Your EFMP should also allow for these features. One, messaging should have an encrypted two-way communication that allows the employee and the employer to anonymously work together to resolve concerns, answer questions, or discuss that feedback. Case management, keeping everything from case assignments to attorney-client designations and investigations to resolution in a single case management system for your admins and company leaders. Should also have data analysis. This allows employers to stay ahead of the curve and track, visualize, and report on data patterns and trends. And finally, it should have secure data security, of course, enterprise grade protection mechanisms and multiple security measures will keep data and information safe and secure. Lastly, and these two features are often overlooked, but so, so critical. Your employee feedback management platform should include a lead routing and SLA feature. Lead routing allows employers to assign incoming reports to the proper administrator. And SLAs, or service level agreements, allow employers to manage expectations by setting processes with shared goals and timelines for responding to and resolving reports. Here is some insight into choosing an employee feedback management platform from an expert in the industry. Sharon Zezema, General Counsel and Chief Ethics Officer at Acoustic, recently shared this tidbit of knowledge during the All Voices webinar, how legal and compliance teams can contribute to company culture. She says, you can go and get a whistleblower hotline and be very specific on what the legal requirement is on having a whistleblower hotline and roll that out to your employees, hopefully getting good adoption, or you can use a real-time culture platform like All Voices for input on anything, including complaints where you're actually engaging on a regular basis with your employees to get feedback anonymously including complaints that would serve the purpose of a whistleblower hotline. Okay, so as you can see, EFMPs or Employee Feedback Management Platforms are a valuable tool for their capabilities and for their direct return on investment. For example, with our customers here at All Voices, 90% of them see their Glassdoor scores increase within the first six months of using an EFMP. And they estimate that an EFMP mitigates or prevents one to two potential lawsuits a year. So as you move forward into 2022, whether you decide to move forward with any employee feedback man management platform, just remember that yes, the state of the workplace is in turmoil. But there are opportunities here, not just for employees, but for employers as well. Implementing a comprehensive feedback strategy through sourcing, understanding, and acting on employee feedback and concerns has a guaranteed return on investment. Great, well, thank you so much for tuning in. I wish you all the best of luck moving into 2022. Great, thanks, Madison. Um, I uh, am going to uh, let people uh, file their questions down in the question box uh, if they have them. And I have a couple here that I want to ask of you, so I'm just going to go right ahead into the uh, question and answer session um, after I let people know a little bit more about the CPE credit. Um, once again, if you uh, to want to obtain your CPE credit for this presentation, Please disable your pop-up blockers in order to access the exam. 
The webcast will close automatically and the final examination will be presented in a separate window. If you have trouble viewing the CPE test or receiving the CPE certificate, please send an email to webcasts with an S at complianceweek.com. Okay, let me get into the questions. Um, here's one. Uh, can you give us an example of a typical lead routing breakdown? What departments are usually involved? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so typically we see HR leadership and occasionally legal leadership um, being those primary administrators. So they're kind of um, the primary admins on an EFMP, ensuring that they're accountable and overseeing all types of feedback. But then when it comes to that more specific, those routing rules and that lead routing, some specific examples are routing to HRBPs or people business partners based on the business, business unit that has submitted the report. So that can be through location, department, any other kind of data that they're able to indicate. Um, or it can be based on what the report is about. So let's say that a report came in about diversity, equity, and inclusion. A great routing rule there is to have uh, your head of DEI or, or your manager of DEI on the tool set up to be receiving those reports automatically. Um, and another one that we often see, especially for those using um, their EFMP uh, for also, in addition to a whistleblower hotline or a whistleblower complaint uh, collection, uh, is, is having that routing to their general counsel or their legal team or to audit committees if needed, if they're a public company as well. So having those set up based on uh, department, location, business unit, so that the right HR partner can take care of it, um, or based off of the type of complaint, whether that's a compliance, you know, ethical misconduct, or you know, something more like culture or DEI, routing those to the appropriate um, team members on your team can be really helpful. Great, thanks. Okay, I've had a number of questions flow in here, so I'm just going to start answering, the, uh, start asking them. Um, what, comp what do companies need to do to stay up to date with the newest Department of Justice guidelines on whistleblowing? That's a great question. So we always want you to adhere to, you know, the jurisdiction of your company, your legal team, where you have employees, um, you know, which countries. But of course, there's tons of resources online through different platforms like All Voices or other EFMPs. Um, you know, if you have a whistleblower hotline, often a lot of those platforms will, will continue to stay on top of uh, those policies in that jurisdiction and ensure that the tool that you have is compliant there. Um, so again, lean on your lean on your vendors there. Lean on your, of course, legal team and, and making sure that everything's compliant there. Um, but again, you know, of course, using those those e, that EFMP, your whistleblower, whatever tool that you have um, for that kind of um, collection of, of of legal matters or anything um, to to stay on top of those and make sure that your tool is compliant. Okay, great. Um, so I've got this question. All employee reports cannot be anonymous. Uh, quotes, Mr. B sexually harassed me, quote unquote. Those complaints need to be investigated. So these EFMPs would be for a certain feedback, but not all. We'd still have to maintain a reporting source that allows for confidential reporting without an anonymity, correct? That's a great question. And I often get that question a lot, you know, working with, with companies as they're rolling this tool out. Um, the tool, you know, and, and an EFMP that, that's centered around anonymity gives employees the option to be anonymous. Of course, there's that capability as well through, you know, the open text of the reporting, you know, any kind of follow-up or messaging to de-anonymize or to share, you know, who was involved. You know, cases like sexual harassment and things that do need to be investigated, you know, that, of course, you can be communica communicative with them that you will need additional information in order to take action and investigate you know, that report. However, the anonymity allows for someone to, fe to feel that they can report that without any fear of retaliation um, and, and have that, that communication with HR or their legal team or whoever they have on as those admins about a concern um, and understand what the process would be like, what would be the next step, what does an investigation look like? You know, many employees aren't sure if I report you know, sexual harassment what even happens next? You know, what what are the steps? So that anonymity can give the ability to um, 
an employee to feel safe going to their leadership, their HR team, and asking, hey, I feel really uncomfortable with this. Um, what, what happens? What's the next step? And you can have that follow-up with them to guide them through it and ultimately have that investigation where you can resolve it, but it can, it can initiate that conversation in a way that feels really safe to the employee. Great, okay. Uh, you were talking about uh, sexual harassment uh, that can occur while you're working from home, and there's a, there's a question related to that here. Uh, can you elaborate how someone could be sexually harassed when they're not near each other or in the same environment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, that stat is really shocking to to a lot of people. You know, they they assume that um, we're not near each other, so there can't be sexual harassment. However, it opens up a whole new, you know, kind of sexual harassment. And especially now with um, so many online platforms, you have to remember that communication is not just in person, and it's not just you know, sexual harassment isn't always just physical touch or, or a physical thing. Um, there can be harassment through through those online platforms. Um, there can be comments made, um, continual comments made on, you know, any kind of platform that's whether a video call or a phone call, um, Slack, there can be inappropriate messages being sent, there can be inappropriate photos or um, requests for sexual favors, things like that can all be done through these these online platforms that that everyone is is um, you know having to to use much more of now, um, so so that's likely what you know I don't have the exact specifics of um, the types of harassment they're seeing in those staff, but what we're hearing and what we're we're understanding is that you know it doesn't have to be in person that physical touch, but there's so many other ways that there can be <clears throat> that inappropriate um, and, and harassment type behavior occurring while we're remote. Great, thanks for that uh, answer. Um, in your experience, what makes an employee feedback strategy rollout successful? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we we see it as you know, there's a few steps here um, into seeing that. And are you asking about the rollout or just the the platform in general? Um, I think they're they're asking what makes it successful. So you know, what are the points? What 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 are the aspects of a of a rollout that make it successful? I think that's what they're asking. Awesome. Okay, the rollout. That's super helpful. Um, yeah. So there's a couple ways that we see rollouts of of this tool being really successful, and some of those we touched on. Uh, but to get more specific, one piece is again incorporating a key executive sponsor or a key executive, um, you know, leader that is going to be sponsoring the tool and and you know being promoting it. That will really make sure that not only are employees trusting that this is you know a priority to the organization but it can also make sure that the team that's implementing this tool knows that it's a priority and that that maybe having to shift away from some of their other you know duties in their role um, to focus on rolling this tool out they know that that's a priority and they know that it's going to be you know well well regarded in the, in the business um, some other ways that we've seen rollouts work really well is having a dedicated team that that is assigned to um, you know, rolling out the tool and focused on it. Um, also collaborating with your EFMP team. Um, so we at All Voices have tons of resources. We've seen what works well and what doesn't. So we're always wanting to work with the company to make sure that it's natural and organic to their business, but also incorporating things that we've seen work really well and, and materials and guides and things like that. Um, so working together with that. And then also multiple touch points. So one email about a rollout of a new tool is going to get lost for a lot of people. So making sure that it's, there's multiple touch points and it's an ongoing promotion of the, the platform is going to make sure that all employees are aware of it, all employees are educated about it, they know what it's there for, um, they know how to use it, they know they can trust it, they know where to go if they have questions about it or, or you know, what it can be used for. Um, so not only through that launch, making the multiple touch points, but regular touch points um, throughout the life cycle as well. Okay, great. Um, we still have time to take uh, some more questions, so I'm gonna, but I'm gonna combine, we've got two questions here about uh, a whistleblower hotline, and I'm gonna ask them both because I think they're both related. Uh, one is, do you recommend an EFMP in addition to a whistleblower hotline? 
And the other is um, uh, how do you separate an EFMP from a whistleblower hotline? And this person says it feels like the lines would be blurred for employees. Awesome. Those are great questions. And again, it's, it's such a changing time where there used to just be, you know, whistleblower hotlines and they were very separate from any kind of engagement survey, things like that. What we've seen work well at our company, at All Voices, is you can include it. Um, the way that our tool works, we have different modules of types of feedback that people can submit, and it will route them through a different flow based on what they select. So if they are, so if they are you know, reporting a whistleblower complaint like fraud or embezzlement, it's going to take them through a slightly different flow than it will if they want to report about a culture issue or a piece of feedback. Um, so there is a little bit of a separation in the tool there, but having the tools in the same place can, one, make it easy for employees. You know, they have one tool they need to go to when they think about feedback or reporting concerns. And then it can also make it easy for the admins and for your leadership to kind of see, you know, where you've had different types of feedback coming up. Are things overlapping? Maybe there's something that someone reported as general feedback, but really it's it's a legal issue. You know, maybe they just didn't categorize it right. So allowing for kind of that, that one, one stop shop for employees to share can give employers the ability to kind of look at it holistically, um, you know, see the trends in data and make sure that they're collecting everything um, all in all in one place. Um, so I hope that was helpful. And then I think the other kind of question was, um, you know, at making sure you have both. I would say yes. Um, obviously, if you are a public company, um, it's required to have that whistleblower hotline. That's that Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So you are required as a public company to make sure that there is a way to report fraud and embezzlement and accounting matters. So if you're public, absolutely. If you're private, doesn't hurt to also have that because it's important things to collect. Um, and, and hopefully you don't get any of those reports, but it's always kind of an important thing to, to have on file should those things come up. Um, and again, kind of tying into the first part of my answer, if you have it in the same place, it's not going to be an additional tool that you have to purchase. Um, it's going to be kind of embedded in there. You've got it there when you need it, but you don't have to, you know, check another platform or, or you know, have another uh, vendor. Got it. Okay. I hope I'm not uh, wearing you out with these questions, but there are a lot. There's a lot of uh, no, not at all. Uh, interest here. Okay, cool. Um, uh, this person asks, how should feedback be handled uh, with whistleblowing for external vendor providers and non-direct staff? Is that different than uh, you know uh, employees that are directly employed by the company? Yeah, that's. That question is it really can kind of come up to the structure of your organization. So we work with a lot of people that do, you know, provide a, a feedback platform to vendors, consultants, partners, clients. Um, it's really up to, to you and your organization. One, you know, how you want to be collecting, who you want to be, you know, within your, your um, organization of like, you know, vendors and partners, how you want to be incorporating them into um, a feedback collection, and then also what resources you have internally to be collecting that feedback. So, you know, your HR team may not be, you know, fully fully staffed to, to measure, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of consultant feedback. Um, but, you know, if you have the resources of maybe partner relations or vendor relations, it could definitely be worthwhile to to be collecting that feedback. Some of the reasons that we are always all for collecting all types of feedback is that it can help you as your organization learn of any issues or bottlenecks or concerns um, directly. So instead of things popping up in the press or public channels or you know, bad experiences listed on review sites or anything like that, giving them the ability to share the feedback directly to you uh, allows you to not only have it privately where it's not you know, broadcasted for other potential vendors or employees to see, uh, but you also have the ability to help resolve it. So if you learn of it directly and you can respond to them, you can work with them and, and, and resolve the issue um, directly and, and privately. So kind of um, in conclusion of that, up to you, of course, as your organization. We definitely see it as a benefit. We think 
all that feedback is helpful, um, but really kind of depends on, on the, the bandwidth your team has and, and you know, the, the, the level of your partnership with those, those outside um, employees. Great, great. Um, I think I'm going to ask one more question, and then I will look to wrap up the uh, webinar. Um, this one is asking about uh, uh, whistleblowers again, and uh, it, he wants to know, how can you encourage whistleblowers to provide more information about their reports uh, in order to ha help the facts, uh, help resolve the facts uh, of the case? Yeah, that's a great question, and this is something that um, we did a lot of user testing. We built out our tool, um, you know, thinking through what makes someone less comfortable to share versus more comfortable to share, and how do we make it not intimidating but still collect what we need to collect. Um, and so there's a few a few thoughts here. One is having that follow-up mechanism is absolutely vital. That's really, really important. Um, you know, making an employee submit a lot of information up front can cause a lot of drop off. That can cause they feel intimidated, they feel they're gonna be de-anonymized, and they just don't, they'd rather just not share, whether that's asking for lots of specifics, lots of identifying information um, up front, um, that, that can cause drop off. If you're asking for a little bit less, you know, categorizing a few things here and there so you know where to route it or which, you know, business unit or location it might have occurred in. Um, you know, can start that conversation, and that's what you want. You want this conversation to start. And then to be able to follow up with that person and say, hey, thank you so much for, you know, submitting this. This is a really serious complaint. And walking them through the process um, can, can help them determine, okay, I see now why I need to give this information, and I know what's going to happen next, so I'm willing to, to share it. I think a lot of the fear of reporting and why there's not a lot of information given is, they're just not clear on what's going to happen, and they're they're afraid that they're going to open a giant investigation or or cause you know a really large thing to happen, and they're they're afraid, they're intimidated, they're scared. Um, so having just the start of the conversation, they can be anonymous, maybe not give that much information, but that follow up where you as an administrator and company company you know advocate or, or uh, admin um, can say, hey, these are the pieces of information that we need in order to um, resolve this issue, and here are the steps that come that come next. Um, you know, you all are, and I'm familiar with the process of an investigation or, or what happens next, but they're not. They really don't know, and I think being as transparent as possible of what those next steps are um, can then make them feel safe with uh, sharing more information um, and working with you hand in hand, and you know, maybe multiple back and forth messages of getting to a resolution. Um, so not asking for so much up front where they feel they're afraid or they're intimidated, they don't know what's going to happen next, but instead just opening that conversation and having a, you know, a real conversation and being as transparent as possible. Great. Thanks. Um, I did say that was the last question, but there is one quick one I think you can answer here. How many languages does All Voices support? Yes. Gosh, I don't know on the top of my head. I believe, um, I believe we can translate to any language uh, that exists. You know, we, we have a translation partner that, that we work with, so um, we can. We've launched in you know lots and lots, hundreds of co countries and different languages. So very flexible there. Yeah, and I think uh, all the questions that everyone has asked will be provided to all voices and, and they can get back to you offline after this uh, webinar is finished. So hopefully you can provide them with the, the answer, but it sounds like you could awesome. do it in any language. Great, great, okay. Um, once again, everyone, I just wanna go over uh, how to get your CPE credits. Um, uh, to obtain the, your CPE credit for this presentation, disable your pop-up blockers in order to access the exam. The webcast will close automatically and the final examination will be presented in a separate window. If you have trouble viewing the CPE test or receiving the CPE certificate, please send an email to webcasts with an S at compliancewoods.com. Uh, Compliance Week's national conference is back in person for the first time since 2019. This is a shameless plug for our flagship event and is unique in its networking opportunities and high quality programming. Click on the register button below to learn more. 
Uh, this webcast has been recorded and will be available later today to Compliance Week members on our website under the Webcast tab, which contains a library of additional CPE webcasts. If you would like to learn more about becoming a member, please contact us at info at compliancework.com. Some of you may know that Compliance Week has recently lowered our membership pricing from $1,199 to $399 in order to build a large community of practitioners. As a full member, you get access to tools and resources, discounts to conferences, and full access to our website. For today only, we invite you to use code WEBCAST365 to receive a membership for just a dollar a day. Check out compliancework.com slash membership to learn more. This concludes our webcast. Thank you again for joining us, and goodbye.